This Almeria post-game episode of the Managing Madrid podcast is brought to you by Manscaped. Roses are red, violets are blue. Trim your balls and your date will thank us too. What's up, fellas? Valentine's Day is knocking and Manscaped is the remedy for what the love doctor ordered. His prescription, the all-new Performance Package 5.0 Ultra designed to elevate your grooming game and shine like the heartthrob you are. Join the 10 million men worldwide who trust Manscaped with our exclusive offer. Go to manscaped.com to snag 20% off and free shipping with the code MANAGINGMADRID. As you guys know, with these weekend postgame shows, we give out the Manscaped Man of the Match Award. And thankfully, Real Madrid got the W today. So we give out a Manscaped Man of the Match Award to a Real Madrid player who helped Real Madrid win. And Mehdi Hassan is here to join me, Kian Sabani, to do that. Mehdi, tell us all who won the Man of the Match today. Hey, Kian, my man of the match award goes to Jude Bellingham, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, he scored the very calm and cool penalty, was so essential in Carvajal's game winner, had a goal disall- disallowed himself, unreal performance, so Jude Bellingham is my man of the match. Congratulations, Jude Bellingham, on winning your first ever Managing Madrid Manscaped Man of the Match Award. Listeners, get 20% off and free shipping with the code managingmadrid at manscaped.com. That's 20% off with free shipping at manscaped.com and use code Managing Madrid because your grooming upgrade awaits, ready to charm your Valentine's dates. Nice article in the Managing Madrid uh, blog. Uh, wonderful lads that do a great job there. And worth reading about that man there. So he bet the man needs to rest in the numbers reveal why. Times ended up almost looking like a 6 3 1. Some very good. Writing about that on the Managing Madrid website. First rate podcast as well. Of course, Pere Valverde was a huge part of the equation. Hello and welcome to a Sunday afternoon edition of the Managing Madrid podcast. I'm your host, Kian Sobani, joined today by Mehdi Hassan. We are recording this not long after the final whistle and what was a very controversial win for Real Madrid over Almeria. Poor 20th place Almeria who can't win a game if their life depended on it. Ironically, they came close in the last two games, Girona and Real Madrid back-to-back of all two games to come close. It was these two. Nevertheless, the Real Madrid remontada was inevitable. The football gods had already written the script. It was foretold. And it is now here, and we are going to break it down. Mehedi, wow, what a Sunday. How are you doing? Yeah, what a Sunday, what a Sunday morning. Uh, so we're in the Eastern time zone. Uh, for me, it was a 10, 15 a.m. start, and the start wasn't, wasn't really great. Uh, I just woke up, uh, turned my TV on, and the Almeria goal scorer was already in his celebration stride by the time I turned on the TV. <laughs> so n- not an ideal start. However, like right after waking up, I did check Twitter and I, I saw your tweet that uh, it's going to be Sergio Ribas on, on minute one and then Jude Bellingham in stoppage time twice. Well, and I, I almost got scared thinking that, is it really Arribas? Is this thinking? Am I still dreaming? Is is this really happening? But as the game, you know, progressed, I did realize it was really happening. Very strange game. I think a lot to talk about in terms of the high emotions uh, at the end and also how the game really progressed. Ancelotti's quotes have been interesting as well. So I think this is going to be a really fun podcast. Well, let's start with the experience of being tired on a Sunday morning and and logging on to watch the game because the Sunday matinees are like historically lethargic, not only for fans, but also the players. Like you can like feel it. Like we're dragging ourselves to the TV, like, (laughs) um, you know, and when I'm in Madrid, I'm dragging myself to the stadium and you get there and you can kind of just feel like everyone's starting to wake up. The players are still kind of half asleep. We saw it today. Uh, the urgency obviously picked up in the second half because they had no choice but to actually get click into gear. And sometimes Real Madrid are just better when they're losing because they have to be better, they're forced to be better, and they don't have to go through the motions. So um, I think we start 
chronologically is the most sensible way to do this because there's just too much going on, too many things. And look, I don't know if uh, it was on the cards for us to break down like tactically and also the lineup, like why it didn't work in the first half against a team like Almeria, but that's where we are. And actually, there are games like this throughout Real Madrid's history, very prevalent, in fact, you could argue that the toughest games that Real Madrid play in their history are, are games like this and not the Champions League finals against the best teams in the world. So uh, right off the bat, some players who did not start against Atletico Mejeri, Tony Cruz, Aurelion Chuomeni. Um, who else? Was that it? Were those the two? I think, I think yeah, I think that's it. Those are the two. That's the list. Okay. The starters, that, that's so it. they get into the starting lineup. There was some theorizing that Fran Garcia might get a nod today, and I actually thought that he made sense in a game like this for reasons that were very clear by halftime, why you need somebody like him to help Vinny on the left flank and get some offense going, and he was a fireball. Him and Ibrahim off the bench were really helpful. Um, thoughts on the lineup, thoughts on what went wrong and why it went wrong. Yeah, so... The starting 11 did surprise me because this is kind of the gala, on Saturday gala right now among available players. One can argue that Mendy, and I, I agree that Mendy should be replaced by Kamavinga in the on Saturday gala. Uh, and the keeper situation is a bit weird right now. I'm I'm not really high on either Kappa or Lunin. Doesn't really matter to me. But apart from that, this kind of is like the strongest 11 from the available players. And I was surprised to see that getting fielded against 20th place Almeria. And my mind immediately went to the place that, okay, this is probably to, you know, recuperate some of the confidence that was lost due to the loss against Atletico. But then again, like we as a club is too big of an institution and our roster is too talented for us to field this 11 against 20th place Almeria because this was the perfect game, the perfect opportunity to think a bit long-term. We have tons of difficult games coming in February. Uh, we have a we have a tough end to January as well. So we didn't really, you know, need to make a big deal out of the Atletico game and do, you know, try to field a statement 11 against Almeria. That being one side of things. And the other side of things is the 11 that was fielded against Almeria didn't really make sense too much from a tactical point of view as well because as you mentioned I think Fran Garcia would have made much more sense we saw the kind of change in shape and movement from the Almeria defense happened when Hoseli was brought in so I think this was the perfect game for someone like Hoseli to start for someone like Fran Garcia to start who's who's crossing is much better than Mendy's and some of the guys like I tweeted about this the Bellingham and Fede look visibly tired within like in the first 20 30 minutes of the first half i don't know how they how bellingham just scraped through the entire 111 minutes uh fede was substituted at some point so uh, in terms of keeping the keeping the rest of certain key players in mind keeping the tactics of the opponent in mind i was surprised to see the onse de gala quote unquote among the uh, available players to be fielded against in this kind of a game uh, the uh, the fatigue. I mean, the Bellingham is has been looked tired. It's a weird one because Bellingham is like always tired, but always transcendent, and it doesn't matter. Like it just like I don't know if it's adrenaline or what it is. He's looked tired for like the past few games, but still been unbelievable against Atletico. He looked gas. He's breathing heavily, but then he's just doing things that are out of this world. Like you tell me, which player who looks tired pulls off like the most insane? Non goal, non bicycle kick goal ever. Like it was like such a clean. Sometimes bicycle kicks are just a disaster. Like it's a farce, right? It's a, they completely miss it. Jude actually had one of those misses earlier, but today's it was so clean. It was such a beautiful, beautiful non goal. Um, so Bellingham continues to be amazing despite looking tired. I think you've seen a dip in energies, uh, in Fede's energy level a bit more. He looks, he looks super tired. Um, the, the Ancelotti arc of fatigue and back and forth is crazy so bef after uh the atletico game uh he said the players were not tired and then today he said the team was tired 
And after the game, he said, I didn't know the team was this tired. And then <laughs> at halftime, he's making those three subs. I mean, the three subs were not obviously just down to fatigue by themselves. It was because we were down 2 nothing. They had to, he had to make drastic changes. Um, so there's the fatigue arc. You can see it. And, and look, like, everyone had kind of circled this game as, like, the Arda Guler game. Like, okay, maybe you don't want to play more against Atletico and Barca. Fine. He did get some minutes and extra time against Atletico in the Supercopa. The last game against Atletico, okay, like, you, you don't want to put him in a game like that, maybe. And then everyone had circled this one as the game where finally we'll see him again in getting more minutes. And then you can kind of see how the game unfolds. And obviously, Ancelotti has just different problems than giving minutes to Arda Guler tonight and that he has to win and he's desperate to win and he has to throw on all of his all of his um, best players. And right now, in his mind, Arda Guler is not ready for that moment yet. So it was hard, and, and I mean, I can I can understand why you want to play Vinicius and Bellingham in games like this because you want them to continue scoring, you want them to keep their confidence up, and obviously they were needed in the game like this. And you know, as the game wears on, you can kind of see why he he didn't rest rest them in a game like this. I think, but from a tactical perspective, I thought Fran Garcia made sense like in a game like this because of the way Almeria was going to approach it. You weren't going to get too much test for, for Mendy. I mean, even a, a really fun player like Arribas, who I really love, he's not going to be a high-volume usage player. He'll have a couple moments here and there. The way Almeria play, Arribas just does not get on the ball that much. He'll have one or two moments of the game. That's it. Did have the disallowed goal, which we'll get to. Uh, I think we have to start with Nacho. Has been making some weird decisions all season. He had the giveaway for the first goal. He had a really terrible clearance that led to the second goal. I think he's the main culprit, and I hate to kind of like phrase it that way, but it is what it is. He was the main culprit. And you can see by the time, like in the first goal, when he gives it away, if you look at Danny Carvajal's positioning on that play, he's up the field, like as a right center forward. He's playing high up the pitch. Yeah. There's no chance in hell he's going to recover in time. He tried, but he just wasn't going to get there. And then, yeah. of all goals to hate on Kepa for, that first goal, I actually kind of understood why he couldn't get it. The way uh, Ramazani was positioning himself, it looked like he was shooting far post. And I think Kepa was aiming to go far post and save it that way as a curler, but he sticks out his leg just in case it goes near post. And... It hits his leg anyway, and it goes in. The second goal, he didn't have a chance in hell. I don't think so. On the Edgar shot was just as crazy. Um, but I, I, I would say Nacho just needs to be more dialed in. And uh, he set, gets subbed at halftime. And Chiu Mani takes the center yep. back role. So that's where we were. <clears throat> yeah, I think. And it's I don't know if it's a statement from Ancelotti too, because until Militao comes back, which now looks more likely that he will play some games this season. He'll it, yeah. it's probably not going to be a complete season out like Courtois and Alaba for Militao. So until he comes back, uh, Ancelotti might go with Chuomeni as the center back because yeah, Nacho's form is really concerning right now. And uh, regarding the goals conceded that you just mentioned. I think our keepers, both Kepa and Lunin, they have just not been aggressive enough in closing down space because even in Aribas's case, Aribas's disallowed goal, Ramazani's first goal, and the couple of goals against Atletico for Lunin, like both of our keepers, I'm just, I just think they're not attacking the space in front of him, in front of them, with more aggression. Just a bit more aggression to close down that space will probably solve some of these. Issues. I know, like some of these are really difficult goals to, uh, you know, prevent. But the problem is the standard in my mind is Thibaut Courtois. He does this. He he used to do this so regularly and so routinely. I, I even tweeted that the uh, the wonder goal is probably routine save for Courtois. He does this every game. Uh, and, but Kepa is a shorter keeper. He he couldn't do anything about it. I, I can understand. The keeper situation not not really ideal right now. No, it's not. I mean, it's not. I I, I still uh, before this game I said it, and I, I will still continue to believe it. Despite I didn't think Keppel was at fault for what happened today, I I would still start Lunin. Um, so we're in this kind of limbo stage of 
they're just rotating right now. And after the game, Carlo Ancelotti said, you know, I've had to rotate before between Diego Lopez and Iker Casillas. And uh, it's, it wasn't that bad and it's not that bad now. So with that out of the way, because I, I really firmly believe that wasn't the biggest talking point today. Uh, <laughs> I think so apart from individual mistakes, and I wanted to say this. After Almeria scored the first goal, they actually nearly score a second. Yeah. And they also nearly score again a second before halftime. And, well, they end, ended up getting the 2-0 eventually, but they nearly got the 2-0 a couple times before that. And nearly had a 3-0, actually, at the end of the half. Yeah. All this a long-winded way of saying, like, we can talk about, you know, we can't score and all this. And, like, the defense was really bad today, too. And, again, Almeria are not a high-volume attacking team. So you really all you have to do is just keep focused and stay concentrated a couple times in key moments, and you should like this is not a high volume testing team. So mm-hmm. Nacho give away twice, punished. The Edgar goal was a freak goal, admittedly, but hey, man, that's football. Uh, what was that guy against Betis who did that to us too with the freak goal? Um, Rui uh, Bal, Rui Bal, crazy okay. golasso, right yeah. in, at the Benito Villa Marina. Yeah. Like, we had it was a wasn't a good defensive sequence. There were mistakes. It was a free goal. But hey, man, you got to be locked in. That's the margin of error in football. The tracking has been abysmal for a good part of two years at least. Um, when we had Casemiro, for all the complaints we had about him in terms of lack of press resistance, his short passing ability, his dribbling ability, he, his effort was unquestionable. I don't know. I can't. I'm not a metro centered expert to know what's going wrong there, but I can only speak for his time at Real Madrid. Uh, even Chu Many, who I think who has had a before the injury in the fall, in the fall winter, he was having a very good season. His tracking still, even when he was playing well, was was questionable on key moments. Mm-hmm. Cruz, who I thought was actually quite good against Atletico defensively off the bench last game, was in the same boat. Um, tracking wasn't great. There was one in the first half where Aribas was wide open and Cruz and Chumani were just jogging and looking at him and hoping that it would get clear so it doesn't get um, uh, looked, un- looked at under a microscope. There were more moments like that and I thought back to, okay, why was our defense so good? Meanwhile, by the way, I should also mention that Jude Bellingham, who is an attacking midfielder, is flying back for like slide tackle interceptions. Like he's actually trying, yep. even though he's not the primary tracker on defense. Yep. I was thinking like, why was our defense so good during the injuries? And I think it came back to the fact that because Fede dropped into a double pivot, mm-hmm. Fede is a reliable tracker. And I think that was part of it. And I kind of wanted, I wanted to get your opinion on this. Was a double pivot working well enough that maybe we should look at that again? Uh, as an option, you mean defensively? I like the double pivot a lot, and uh, it was working because you see the profiles of our midfielders give you that liberty to change these things even on the fly. If even if you have hadn't started the game that way, uh, this gives the flexibility to Ancelotti. Even if he wanted to, you know, put pull into a double pivot mid game, he could have done that. And to go back to your question, I think it was working. And that was basically our most stable uh, period this season where we had that assurance at the back and also were attacking pretty well. So I understand now that now that the team is coming back together, the, there are less injuries. Ancelotti has that tendency or has that wish to go back to the 4-4-2 diamond again. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't mind if we ended the season with a double pivot because it's simply because the versatile profiles that we have, you can fit in pretty much any two of them, especially the ones that are more equipped to, you know, do the defensive duties like the Kamavingas, Fadis, Chumanis. If you pair any of them with Cruz, it works. You pair a Kamavinga and Fede, I think that works as well. You pair Kamavinga and Chumani, that definitely works. So yeah, I don't mind it. And if you if you even go back to see the four two 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 formation, also I think helps us better in attack. Uh, we, Sid and I recently did a podcast with Clarissa, who has got a bit of an expert on Ancel Lori's tactics, uh, it, and it was pointed out that even without a out and out number nine, how 
Vinicius and Rodrigo can exploit space on the flanks. It's it's just beautiful because you have a supreme ball controller in the midfield just ahead of the pivot and Jude Bellingham. So that was really great. And I wouldn't mind if we just stuck to that in, instead of going back to the diamond, to be honest. What about offensively? Um, I'm curious to know what you saw because there were the clear defensive problems and the individual mistakes mm-hmm. we were making on top of that. Which, to me, a lot of it like is... Structurally, I haven't had a huge problem with Real Madrid's defense. It's a lot of mm-hmm. individual bad decisions, whether it's an individual not tracking when it's pretty clear that you should be tracking or just mm-hmm. giveaways and careless passing. And I, and I said this on Twitter. If I'm Ancelotti, I'm just showing like endless film on loop of all these sequences mm-hmm. where Chua, Mani, Cruz, and et cetera, are not tracking on these sequences. And these players are in the box and like Rudiger and, and Nacho are trying to mark the the cutback, they're trying to clear, the, and then there's like f- four players converging in the box that they also have to mark. It's, they're, they're left on an island. Um, offensively. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Kian, can you pull up the Real Deal Pods Twitter account on your screen? It, so it's going to be a better to show it because sure. we just put the Give me a match second. dashboard out. Sure. <clears throat> why don't you... Um, why don't you... Why don't you tee it up for us while I bring it up? Yeah, sure. So even after conceding a couple of goals, and definitely after conceding the first goal, our reaction offensively was not something ideal, I thought. Because Mm. we conceded so early, and then the process was basically... Cruz, Mendy, Vinny, Rodrigo, and Jude all kind of like congregating on the left side with no one in the box. Like Vinicius is making these, trying to make these dribbles and trying to make these inroads inside the box. And then he has to pass it to someone and uh, Fede and Carvajal are basically nowhere to be seen. Uh, That happened, I think, for the entirety of the first half. Uh, And we didn't really get much out of it. It was the same from the left hand side as well, uh, from the right hand side as well. Uh, as you can see, the congregating thing that I was mentioning. This is the past network of Real Madrid is before the first substitution was uh, made. Mm. So as you can see, everyone, Vinny, Rodrigo, Bellingham, well, Mendy and Cruz play on the left anyway. So Bellingham, Vinny, and Rodrigo are all on the left side. They're trying to, you know, invite the press. They're trying to make a run here and there, but. Fede and Carvajal are not really hosilu that they're they're going to come for a cross or anything inside the box. So that happened for quite some time and I didn't like that approach at all. Things only started to change after the three substitutions in the first half. The game kind of opened up to both flanks from that point on. Carvajal was a bit more advanced at that point. Uh, and also, one thing that really bothered me during the first half while we were playing with the double pivot and while we had that purple patch of offensively, the regular third man runs, the regular, uh, you know, off ball runs really hurt opponents. But as probably Jude and Fetty, these guys were so tired or at, at least looked tired in the first half. I barely saw those kind of runs in the first half, but by the second half started, <laughs> uh, those things started to happen again because you had more uh, quality people on the right with Brahim trying to, uh, do something, Brahim, Fede, and uh, Carvajal had, had something good going on for a while. So when the game was kind of bit evenly opened up on both flanks, that that helped Madrid. But the approach was pretty simple. When you don't break these kind of defenses, you try to spam crosses as many as you want. And uh, just look at like how many goals, like all three of our goals were, you know, kind of as a result of, some kind of cross. Uh, uh, I I actually just missed the part where, like how we got the penalty. I I saw the I saw you taking the shot, so I missed the part how we got the penalty. But even Vinny's goal, even Carvajal's goal. Uh, th- these like this is the kind of a game that led to yeah, the, this yeah, is the kind awesome. of a ga- game where where you have to you know keep spamming the crosses uh, until you score, and we we scored three and by. Spam, spam him enough crosses. So the approach that probably could, should have been taken in the first half from the beginning, we we left it a bit late, but we got the W, the most important thing. 
but how we performed offensively first half and second half is very contrasting i would say people people get upset about the idea of spamming crosses i also don't think they realize how much chaos it it generates and how conducive that is to you scoring whether it's through deflections rebounds second chance options it gives you a chance to counter press and win the ball in dangerous areas while the defense is scrambling Pep Guardiola himself said it was it's one of the best ways to break a low block is just to cross incessantly. So it's definitely a tool, especially when, I mean, I think one of the problems that, and it's interesting on this uh, pass map that you guys created here, you see Rodrigo. The last couple games, this one and the Atletico one, Rodrigo has started more on the right and has provided a little bit more symmetry. You see his pass network here too. It's more in the middle though. And I think that was also part of it that in the first half, Rodrigo was very wide and he just wasn't getting the ball. There wasn't any switches coming his way. It was very rare unless like Carvajal or Fede himself were coming out of the back playing the pass down the line. Rodrigo was not getting the ball at all. And Vinny often, like I was looking at the uh, heat maps in at halftime and I guess you have uh, here somewhere touch maps. Yeah, this is... Yeah, so the touch map is basically the heat map, and but this is like for the entire 90 minutes. Right, so I checked the heat maps on who scored at halftime, and the only player who was getting touches in the box was Vinicius, nobody else. And you look at how he was getting those touches. Almeria had like just four or five players there in that, in that, in that left half space ready to swarm him. And that's why I also talked about Fran Garcia, because Fran Garcia could at least maybe drag some defenders away with some overloads. And maybe you could get either a quicker switch to decongest the Almeria defense or have Rodrigo come over to the left half space and link up with Vinicius a little bit more. And I think that was something that... And, and I, I just wanted to say this because I know the second half it was better, more urgency. I think Brahim and Fran immediately made an impact in terms of intensity. Kamavinga was also very good off the bench. It's kind of like... it. it it sucks a little bit for Rodrigo, and, and I think by extension the team, that Rodrigo just does not get on the ball much when Vinicius is on the field. He's very quiet. Ooh. It's a symptom of Vinicius having a lot of touches on the field. when he, it's, it's, It goes through him. And you barely just see Rodrigo. You don't notice him. And the, obviously the, the numbers reflect that he's getting far fewer touches on the ball when Vinicius is in the team. Sorry, I'm just going to bring back. So... That I think when Vinicius is on the field, the reality is that Rodrigo just has less touches. He's less prominent. He has less opportunities to break lines. And I think there needs to be a way that we can figure out. And by the way, they link up well together, actually. It's like that happens. But again, in a game like this, you either see Rodrigo far out wide, not receiving a switch, not getting on the ball. And if he comes over to the left side, then you can kind of see them link up a little bit more. But I think one of the symptoms of Vinicius being on the field, and he is great, so I'm not complaining about it too much, but having Rodrigo more on the ball, I think, is more conducive to us creating better chances because he's one of the best line breakers in the world. When he has the ball at his feet and the defense is congested, you need someone to, to unglue the defense, and Rodrigo is amazing at that. So I think we need to figure out how to get him more involved when, when Vinicius is on the field. True. Um, okay. So, first half, problems on offense, problems on defense. Almeria scored two goals through our mistakes. We go into halftime, whistles. Ancelotti said they were right to whistle because we played, we were terrible in the first half. What else? Is there anything else from that first half before we get into the second half chaos, which had enough events in that second half to, to last us? an entire day talking about that half, but anything else from the first half? No, nothing else from the first half, except that I think Jude was telling something vividly to the refs while walking back to the tunnel. He wasn't, he wasn't impressed at all. And I did like what Ancelotti says, said about the whistles because to, to other clubs, this is kind of this evil foreign concept that how can your own fans boo your players? But this is like 
like uh, this is something completely normal at Real Madrid and it's been happening for years and years and years. And Ancelotti has been one of those managers who always acknowledges this, that if the fans are booing, that means we were, we were not playing well. He has done it in the past as well and he did, did this again. And, you know, Kian, some of the things that he said, like the players were looked a bit lethargic and then transcended in the second half, might have had something to do with Ancelotti's halftime team talk because uh, Carlo wasn't impressed from the looks of it either. Uh, yeah, how the team was playing, and uh, the team like the team was playing a completely different game in the second half. So, yeah, he definitely acknowledged the performance of the first half and then changed things as necessary. There's a we ha- often people ask like you know I don't I've never been to a Real Madrid game before I don't know what to do where to go how to behave and of course we always refer them to Eduardo Alvarez's famous article that he wrote a few years ago and the whole thing is about what do you do before the game which restaurant do you go to what food to pack how to behave all this and one of the things he says in it is um boo like, if you want to, boo. I mean, this guy is a socio for 30 years. He's had the same seat in the burnabout for 30 years, right? He's been to every single home game. Um, so, and, and this is part of the culture is that, like, if you're not satisfied with what you're seeing, you can boo. <clears throat> and I don't personally mind the booing. I think there's a, probably a, a, a toxicity that exists where a certain line is crossed, obviously. But in the end, booing is an opinion, and it's, it's a world of free speech. So boo if you want. Um, and certainly the players have to be thick-skinned enough to to respond to that appropriately. And I guess the idea behind it is to light a fire in your ass and give you a reality check. Is it always appropriate? Maybe, maybe not. Today, I think the team was bad. And uh, keep in mind, you're not playing at home against um, the 1989 AC Milan team. You're playing against a team that hasn't won all season and is no way in hell a team that's good enough to be beating you by two goals. With that being said, they go into the second half with three changes. Nacho, who looked dejected on the bench, I'm sure with himself, with everything, for his two mistakes and being subbed off. He's sitting. Uh, Fran Garcia comes in for Mendy. Um Sorry, I'm blanking now. Oh, let me just, just bring it up. Um, so it was Brand Fran Garcia, Mendy. Brahim Diaz. And Joselu for Rodrigo. Joselu, that's the one I was blanking on, right. For Furlan Mendy, Nacho, and Rodrigo. <clears throat> and look, I, I, I kind of thought it was harsh that Rodrigo got to come out, but, you know, Ancelotti needed to bring somebody out for Brahim and, uh, and or Joselu. And Vinicius to him is is on Jude level in terms of untouchability in, in superstardom and players who can change a game. So that's what it was. Brahim and Joselu and Fran Garcia. And I thought Joselu, the three things happened. I didn't no, notice Joselu's energy as much as I noticed Brahim and Fran Garcia's. But I did notice Joselu's presence in that it he brought some gravity with him with Almaria had to all of a sudden acknowledge, which didn't exist in the first half. So that was important. And um, so that happened. So tell me how about the subs and tell me how that changed the second half. Yeah. First of all, I have to, you know, appreciate the hell out of Hozilu because just before he was subbed in, in the Madrid Twitter accounts, there was a stat going on that Hozilu is, I think, 14th in the Real Madrid squad in terms of minutes played. And he's the third top goal scorer. Mm. And Hozelu might have been the most, you know, risk-free but high reward signing of Real Madrid's recent history. And you see, this this guy brings in so many things that we try to bring in with so many other backup strikers in Chicharito, even in, in Luka Jovic, and some of the other names like Mariano, Borja Mayoral. Uh, Morata was great that won won 2016-17 season but barring that our backup strikers no one in our backup strikers have performed as well as Joselu has this season 
uh, a no bullshit player, uh, occupies his spaces. He's wasteful sometimes too, as as any forward, and he's probably more wasteful than a top striker would be. But the the goals he's scoring at at crucial times uh, is great. Uh, even he, you know, his, his goal I think equalized us against Atletico as well. But then the game went haywire from there on. Today I was so impressed with Jose Luis because the moment he walked in. At least one Almeria defender had to be occupied with him. That allowed yeah. Jude to make those free runs, Jude to make those off ball runs that I mentioned earlier in the podcast. So Jose Luis' inclusion was, from a tactical point of view, really important. Uh, I'm happy that Ancelotti realized that. And uh, yeah, obviously he didn't, he wasn't as involved as Ibrahim or even a Kamavinga who, who came in uh, even later than Jose Luis and Ibrahim, but. He was great. His his presence made other pieces around him move better, and that actually I would say resulted in, in a couple of goals. Because as you see, like uh, in the winner that Carvajal scored, no one was tracking Carvajal. Someone was tracking Hozilu on that post, mm-hmm. but no one was tra- tracking Carvajal. So th- yeah. these things these things matter in a game, even if you are not scoring, if you are occupying those kind of spaces. Because if if you are a towering six foot five striker. Uh, like Hozilu, no defender is going to leave you free and uh, not everyone can be you know, marked man-to-man as well and Carvajal wasn't marked man-to-man and he scored the goal so great props to Hozilu, uh, props to Ancelotti for realizing the, the mistakes of the first half and immediately injecting that freshness with Fran Garcia and Brahim which helped the team a lot. Jude's disallowed goal was so 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 good if Fran Garcia could like keep himself just on side. That would have been one of the best goals of this season. That was such a devastating goal. I love love that so much. But yeah, you could see the team playing at a different gear at that point. Um, yeah, I completely agree about the cause of the point. Probably not going to be jumping out as a headline in a game like this, but he deserves his flowers for how he changed the game in a, in a different kind of way. Fran Garcia's crosses were incredible today. His just pinpoint whipped in. With the perfect velocity, perfect arc, and perfect weight, um, they were just so dangerous. And again, something that Almeria didn't have to deal with in the first half, and now they had to. They had to deal with just new things. Um, All right, so we talked about the 1-0, the 2-0. Now we talk about, we had to talk about 1-2, 2-2, and 3-2. So the first goal is the penalty. Yeah. Yeah. by the rules, it's a penalty. I think you can have a different conversation about whether it was harsh and whatnot, in, in which case you're having a different conversation about what the rules should be. The handball rules in football have ch- been changed constantly. <clears throat> um, and in this case, he had the outstretched arm, and it was a penalty. Jude scores. By the way, the Jude taking the penalty. So... This is a kind of a new thing, obviously. He was designated as the penalty taker against Barca, but then there's that famous scene where he gives it to Vinicius and he says, next one is mine. For for whatever reason, there was like pushback about the idea that we had that Bellingham should be the penalty taker. I'm not sure why. He strikes it really well. And today he scored his penalty. That's 2-1. Before we get to the 2-2, Oh, yeah. did you want to jump in? Yeah, yeah. I just okay. wanted to say a couple of things about the penalty. So this is the penalty situation at Real Madrid right now is a bit strange because at first, at the beginning of the season, it was supposedly Vinicius, Vinicius because he yeah. was like the main man. He His first penalty shot was a great shot, but it, it hit the post. Yeah. Uh, then I think Rodrigo missed one, Modric missed one, Joselu missed one. Uh And as you mentioned, against Barcelona, Jude was supposed to take it, but Vinicius was on a hat-trick, so he let him take that. Now, I don't mind Jude taking our penalties at all. He's the top scorer. It helps us Pichichi uh, charge as well. And I do trust him as a shot taker to take a good penalty. His his penalty today was probably, I would say, a 6 or 6.5 out of 10. It wasn't the best strike, but it was good enough. But it was cool. Yeah, It was good and it it was calm. He went for Uh, deception and uh, placement. Yes, yes, true. Edging his bets Uh, that the the goalkeeper would dive. True, true. But 
my preference always is that the best player or like the player with the best penalty skills at that point in the 11 players should take the shot. We saw even when Benzema was fighting for the Pichichi, Ramos would take it because Ramos was an exceptional penalty taker. And he would take Panenka's every day and the keeper would still not, not know it. And <clears> But so, like, who is that player? That's, that's the thing. We don't really Hoselu. know. Th- that Hoselu. player, yeah, Hozelu is, if Hozelu is on the ground, I think in theory, he should be the first choice every game because he is that devastating, you know, hit the top of the goal kind of player. And... I mean, a but lot of his goals with Espanol were penalties that year. Were penalties, exactly. Yeah. So, But I don't think that kind of hierarchy is set in the current squad. It's just, I think every game, it might be someone different or Ancelotti lets the players decide. Because if if the coach had decided it, uh, then I think Hozilu would take it. And what what do you think thought of? Modric didn't come on at all today, right? Or, okay, yeah. What, what did you think about that? Uh, just back to the penalties really quick. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, I, I also think there is some degree of chance and bad luck in that we've had several penalties this season with different penalty takers, and they've been misses. It could also just be a coincidence that, you know, these guys are good penalty takers that just happened to miss the last few ones. Um, I mean, we've seen Modric score a penalty kick in a World Cup knockout doesn't get more high pressure than that rodrigo scored a penalty in uh am i am i making that up did he not score a penalty? i mean he missed his world cup one so i can't bring that into equation but didn't he have one with us at some point no he didn't no i mean rodrigo part. like you're saying a miss or a goal no i mean uh, a goal yeah, he he did score from penalties for us this season. Probably not. Not last this. Season he not this season. Yeah, last I, season he I, scored. I remember. From it. Anyways, he, so, he scored against Barca, didn't he? In the three-one win at the Bernabeu, he scored a stoppage time penalty against Barca. That's right. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking of. I thought there was another one that was even more high stakes than that, but maybe I'm mistaken. I can't remember. Speaking I'm of Barca, point, watching football for Barca. Yeah, Isco just scored two goals in three minutes, and it's two-two. What? I literally just checked. It was two-nil for Barca. No, Isco You're just kidding. scored twice, twice in three minutes. <laughs> Don't give us hope, Isco. Come on, man. <laughs> Jesus. But you know what I thought about, like how how quickly football can change. Because I mean, it was very much on the table that. Uh, you know, and, and Diego keeps saying, man, La Liga's over, La Liga's over. I'm like, dude, stop it. You're only seven points back. All it takes is for us to slip once, and then it becomes four points. And then four points yep. is nothing, you know? Yep. Uh, that's how quickly football can change, and it almost did today. Uh, and we and have another so Classico to play, too, so. Yeah. Um, there's plenty of... Funny enough, it's not the Classico that I'm worried about. I'm worried about these games, like, you know, <laughs> these games. Uh all right, so oh, you asked me about Modric. Um, yeah, yeah. I don't have any problem with him not playing today. I mean, I'm sure he he himself, I'm sure wanted to be on the field. Uh, the energy, the the energy that Ceballos has in a game like this with his counter pressing and his um, just work rate and tenacity, it made sense that he would he was the sub today. I don't know. I don't know enough about the Modric situation. I don't know. I, I'm surprised he didn't play. But mm-hmm. um, so right before the two-two, <clears throat> Arribas has the disallowed goal. The inevitable Arribas scores against us. Obviously, he scored against us way at the beginning of the season, and then he scored today, but it was disallowed. It was the right decision to disallow the goal. Another controver- another controversial thing that is not actually controversial if people thought about it logically. So that's another correct call. Um, I think what people were upset about was that the referee was there in the first place looking at the foul and didn't call it. And then you had to have the whole VAR review and had to bring it back. Like That's a different That discussion. is exactly the reason why VAR is there. If the referee makes correct. a mistake, even with his spare eyes, that is the reason why VAR was invented for. So I, I don't think there's anything to complain about that. Correct. Yeah. Getting mad at VAR for changing 
uh, cause that would have affected the outcome of the game. That's literally what it's set for. That's that's so that's still two one for Almeria, and then the two two is the Vinicius one. So we have two calls that are correct up until that point. This is the one what I think is the most uh, ambiguous or at least hard to decipher and interpret because you're not sure where it hits and the replays weren't sure. Just a reminder for people, the new handball rule is that if you're watching on YouTube, you can see my silly little um, depiction on myself. Here and up is not a handball. Observe, here and up is not a handball. For those listening in their car or while they're cooking and listening to on iTunes or Spotify, you're not watching this expert um, diagram that I'm doing right now, here and up. I'm basically the shoulder and the curvature of the shoulder. That part of, if, it, if you're wearing a short sleeve shirt, that's not a handball. Now, the, 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 there is a replay, and there was the last replay that ESPN showed that kind of, I think it hits about here to me, maybe halfway th- on each part of the arm. Like it was kind of like upper bicep, shoulder. And that's the one I think if there's a controversial call, it's that one. Uh, and it depends on which replay you're looking at. And I, I don't know what your interpretation of that one is. I think that's the toughest one to decipher. I think if this goal was scored against Real Madrid, I would have my doubts. But if a 50-50 call goes towards the attacker it's not something very new like these things happen all the time these things will probably happen against Real Madrid in the future and we would have to be okay with it Uh, but I don't think it is as outrageous as some of the Barcelona fan Twitter accounts are making it out Oh, Barcelona fan Twitter accounts oh we should yeah Hold yeah, on. yeah. <laughs> we looked them up. I really need an objective analysis. Hold on. Hold on. <laughs> so they're the only people you you wouldn't see a Almeria fan talking strongly about it. It's it's going to be a Barcelona fan talking very. Well, strongly Almeria about are freaking it. out about it. the players and coaches anyway. <laughs> well, obviously they were in the ground, but, but I I think it's I think it's pretty pretty shameful that the new like people like they're supposed to be neutral like the commentators or. Um, I mean, uh, to be fair, I think a lot of people who aren't Real Madrid fans just hate Real Madrid. So they, to me, yeah. it was just it's it's mass hysteria, right? It does not, mm-hmm. it's, Mehdi, it's not that hard to immobilize people. You yeah. just, I you can I, I wrote this comment in our Discord channel. You had the right concoction, the right recipe for hysteria today. You had yeah. the Almeria coach going like this, gesturing. I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> you had Vinicius being on the end of the call, and he is public enemy number one. Yeah. People hate him. Then you had the Barca fans um, being triggered, and it was just like, you, you know, you have like a little fire. I my grandfather yeah. used. I have this very traumatizing memory when I was a kid. We were camping, and my mm. grandfather, for whatever reason, um, he the fire wasn't getting very big, so he took a gasoline tank and he wow. poured it. On the fire, and it just went crazy. The whole campfire was like, <laughs> put it out quickly. Damn. I was screaming. I was like four years old. I was crying. I, I'll never forget that day. It stuck in my memory. The b- football Twitter and the hysteria is my grandfather in that moment. They just add, <laughs> add, add fuel to the fire, and it just becomes this uh, uncontrollable, raging fire. And at that point, no one is thinking with logic. It's all emotion. You can't reason with someone who's that emotional. It's impossible. You can't. So, anyways. Uh, my my sense is this: the first two calls are correct. The third call is probably correct, but at least it's mm-hmm. the most um, it's it's the most difficult one to decipher because of the replays that were coming out. The last yeah. one was the most clear, and even then, it's not entirely clear to me. But I think it's on the upper echelon of the arm, <laughs> so yeah. it's basically shoulder. And and the and the rules are so ambiguous, right? You we saw what happened in the they change it all the time, also, yeah, which is hard to keep that, up with. The entire sphere of the ball has to be out of the line. Now, does the entire sphere of the ball has to be on the upper part of the arm or some part can be on the lower part of the arm? Which yeah. part is touching the ball? So th- there's all kinds of stuff. And to me, it 
uh, well, call me biased. Uh, I don't care. But to me, it wasn't. It was controversial. I agree, but it wasn't as outrageous as, as it is being shown as. I wish I could. I mean, I'm not allowed to. Um, I would this, the the YouTube channel would get struck with a copyright claim. But it would be good to just bring it up now and share it, and we could all mm. watch it together, kind of thing. But I can't do that. Um, all right. So those were the decisions. Those were the big calls. I think we went through all of them. Uh, back to the game. Uh, mm-hmm. what do the you, third goal. The third goal. Uh, I'll be very honest. I, this is very unprofessional, but I have no idea what happened. I just kind of like started <laughs> celebrating. What happened? Carvajal scored. That's all I know. Yeah. So there was a there was a cross. There was a trademark Chuameni pass. I've been a bit mad about Chuameni in the last couple of games. Yeah. But if you have followed on Twitter, there has been a Chuameni Hollywood pass or something compilation going around on Twitter. It's every first time long ball that Chuameni sends beautifully for France, for Real Madrid. It's it's a great compilation. And I was thinking that in all of these compilations, most of the frames are from either France games or Monaco games. I was a bit sad that there are not too many Real Madrid passes uh, like that for from Chuameni. Part of the reason is because he plays really deep for Real Madrid. For Monaco and for France, he actually sometimes plays a bit of an advanced role and gets into positions from where these passes look really pretty. Today, while playing as a center back, he actually got into that kind of a position and pay, played a pinpoint pass to Bellingham. And then Bellingham, being Bellingham, didn't take the shot. He he was aware of his position so well. So he laid off a headed pass towards Hozulu originally. But as I mentioned earlier, someone was tracking Hozulu. No one was tracking Carvajal. Carvajal was at the end of the move and scored the goal. Carvajal was also at the start of the move because, uh, oh, I think I'm messing it up. I think Chuameni's pass was during Vinicius's goal. I'm sorry. My apologies. I'm, I'm just, yeah, my, my, <laughs> mind is, my mind is fried too. I'm, I'm, I'm just like, here sitting, smiling and nodding because I don't remember the third goal. I'm watching yeah, yeah, it now. Yeah. But now, now I, 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 uh, it's back to my memory. Carvajal actually starts the move and he finishes the move. That is why it was so impressive on him. He was, he was part of the buildup for this goal as well. And then our players just go berserk. Carvajal doesn't care about the yellow card. He takes off his shirt off. He takes his shirt off like Cristiano Ronaldo and keeps, uh, you know, pumping the air. Uh, utter madness. Props to the referee because he uh, justifiably and uh, very, very nicely calculated the stoppage time that we needed to score the third one. It actually, like, and, so there's been so many studies, Mahiri, about this that, like, <laughs> even when you go at 10, 11 minutes of injury time, you're still like 20 minutes short of how much time was actually wasted. Yeah. Like it's, yeah. it's never and accurate. It, it this actually, is the first time in minutes it should have been. Uh, I'm going to ha- probably have to ask Sam if he knows about this because he does the, does the stats piece. Uh, this might've been the first Real Madrid game that has had more than 10 minutes of stoppage time. It's usually, I think the mo- the team with these kind of games in La Liga, most times it is either Catafe or Atletico, the teams who get these like 10, 11, 15 minutes of stoppage time. I don't remember seeing a Real Madrid game with an 11 minute stoppage time, but it's good that we had that and that was correct. A lot was happening in the second half and uh, that was the correct decision. And it gave us enough time to score the goal and grab all three points. Uh, I think it's Ibrahim who makes a great cross. Jude's header is great because he redirects it to the far. Excuse me to the far post, and uh, I didn't really realize that in real time. But Carvajal has a lot to do to get to that ball, and it's it's a pretty tight angle to score from as well. <clears throat> so it's a it's a well worked goal, and that's in minute uh, ninety nine, Mehdi. So yeah, I, I thought it's funny because I might as well just bring this up. Um, <laughs> I'm going to share my screen here. Sure, go ahead. Uh, So here's the tweet that Managing Madrid put uh, before the game. (laughs) And I've never seen a prediction (laughs) uh, be, be, be wrong but so correct at the same time. 
So the prediction was Sergio Arriba scores in the first minute and Jude Bellingham scores in the 99th and 100th minute. So we got a first minute goal, but it wasn't Arribas. It was Ramazani. And then we got a goal in the 99th minute. <laughs> it's uh, pretty crazy. Um, and it could have, it, it was almost Jude's goal. If he directs it to the goal, it, it might have been Jude's goal and on the 99th minute. Yeah. Yeah, you would never beat the Illuminati allegations after this if if Jude actually scored in the 99th minute today. <laughs> uh, I Yeah, I, I think it would have been uh, time to retire at that point. Uh, awesome. Uh, anything else? No, I think I think we pretty much got all of it. Uh, Jude is suspended for the next game, by the way. So it's against Las Palmas. I'm pretty sure he did it on purpose because he knows Ancelotti is not going to rest him. <laughs> I don't even remember the Jude yellow card. <laughs> Uh, he got a yellow card for something. Uh, so he's suspended for Las Palmas. Another game, by the okay. way, where uh, opponents get free reign to break our legs and not get carded. And then we get booked for descent or something ridiculous. Mm-hmm. I'm not even saying it was booked for descent. I don't remember it. But it happened like every La Liga game this season. Uh, all right. So well, here's what we're going to do, Mehdi. So Lucas and I are recording tomorrow, I think. Diego... And I are also recording on Churros. I'm sure he has uh he's ready, he's sharpening his knife about all the all the referee calls. And little yeah. does he know I'm just gonna we're, we're like, gonna no, hear from no, Diego no. about how Florentino paid someone to buy parking lot space in front of Bernabeu tomorrow. Something something like that for sure. <laughs> He'll find a way. Um and uh so we'll have more more analysis there. On Tuesday we have a special guest. Tuesday I'm kinda of doing this thing where I'm bringing on more guests. On the podcast, mm-hmm. and then uh, the rest of the content will be over on patreon.com slash manager where we do like three shows minimum a week now. So mm-hmm. Atletico post game show uh, last week, Copa del Rey, or just a few days ago, was only for patrons. Then we had a big mailbag. I had a big section on Vinicius on the uh, Friday episode. That's all over on patreon.com slash manager or just join YouTube memberships. I also wanted to give a quick shout out to our patrons over on patreon.com slash managing Madrid. If you pledge $10 or more per month, not only do you get access to everything, but you also get guaranteed responses to your questions and you get a specific shout out on the podcast. So shout out to these patrons who pledge $10 or more per month. Daniel Smith, Ramtin Makrur, Bella Chow, Adam Dorsey, Adar Zalukovic, Azaz Hussein. Alex Perez, Alex Thyberg, Alexandria McCaskill, Ananya Kumar, Andres Silvestre, Anthony Tharp, Armando L, Armand Gashi, Armash, Arnab Mukherjee, Brandon Stevens, Brandon Powers, Caden Casillo, Carlos Fuentes, Christian Acosta, Christian Toth, Connor McMorrow, Daniel Williams, Deadpool Lover, Eloy Enriquez, S.A. Davisito, Fabian Moreno, Frederick Sundros, Frederick Rantakiro, Gary Cohut, Graham Gerard, Howard Moore, Hamed, Ian Marley, Jacob P, Jason Fitz, John Fernandez, Jose Cruz, Jose Osorio, Kevin Rivera, Halfan Alkabi, Kunal Tilakar, Leon Stavernakis, Logan Stahl, Magnus Lex, Martin Ridman, Matthew Atkins, Marin Myrtle, Michael Zinberg. Um, bear with me here. Hold on. There's so many. I got to go to the second page now. Um, and it's loading and I'll say thank you while it loads to everyone who is uh, pledging $10 or more but everyone all of our patrons you guys do such an amazing job of supporting the show thank you for being part of the family alright list goes on MJ Diego Naveen Ndaba Halambangana Nelson Mazariego Nick Ribeiro Nicholas Moller Oscar Barrera Paulo Fierro Peter P Phoenix Rishi D Sai Mohan Sasi Kumar Said Mahad Sam Razi Samuli Justin, Santos Solorzano, Sergio Arispe, Sheikh Khatiri, Samanchu Singh, Sujai Wani, Sushank Damala, Tahmid Kalam, Tobias Royal Botcher, Wamik Jamal, Wasim Haddad, Will Sousa, Willie Reed, and Brandon Alvarez. Thank you guys so much for being part of the Real Madrid family. Uh, look forward also to seeing you guys on the next weekly Zoom call. Mehedi, thanks for jo- joining, my friend. We will uh, reconvene soon. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your Sunday. Thank you, bro. Thanks, Kian. Thanks, everyone.